Hello there, this is Groovy and G and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I've got a really sick video where we're going to take a step back in time and space and we're going to go and explore all the techniques that were pioneered by these early jungle producers during its rise to popularity in the 1990s. We're diving into the secrets behind the beats and revealing the trademark sonic magic that gave birth to some of the most legendary tracks in electronic music history. Okay, so let's start with bass and the first technique we're going to look at is how they originally made the wobble bass. Super sharp shooter, shooter shots. Okay, so what I have here is the logic sampler and by default when we don't load anything in this it's just going to play a sine wave. Um, and this is all we need for this technique. Um, and so what we're going to do is pitch this right down so we can get to the sub region. So some of you probably can't even hear that. And in this technique, what we've actually got to do is play two notes side by side at the same time. And you, then you get that wobble and you could play um, one more note so have a whole uh, two semitone difference. And the wobble is actually going to increase, but I think we quite want this slow wobble for this and if I just record the kind of MIDI in of these two notes side by side and then what we're going to do is just bounce that down so resample it is how this is going to work and then you can see uh, very clearly the wobble in the waveform there. Okay so the next thing to do is to load this into uh, a sampler again and so I'm going to just drag this bit of audio into the sampler and then the first thing is probably to actually put a loop on as well, just so we can have this thing go on and on indefinitely. So that's sounding pretty good. So now we've got wobbles forever and ever. And so uh, in this sample, if I put the depth up to a whole octave and then I play with this envelope a little bit, you can hear we get a really cool decreasing pitch envelope. Okay, cool. So the next bass is probably the most common bass we're going to hear in jungle music from the 90s and it's still used a lot today. And what it essentially is, is just a sine wave. But where these originate from is on the old archives. Whenever you'd load a new program, when you just turn it on and load a new program, they would come with these basic waveforms like a saw wave and a pulse wave and also a sine. So artists would just repurpose that sine to make a really good sub bass for their tunes. There are also a few other classic bases that deserve a special mention and not all of these were created by jungle artists but a lot of them were resampled and taken from other places and then really came to fame or were used a lot in jungle tunes and the classics include the Reese bass, the Hoover bass, the Dread bass and the Stab bass all were used a lot during the 90s and the early 2000s. <laughs> Another essential process we see being used a lot by both hip hop artists and jungle artists in the 90s is filtering. Filters are a great way to shape sounds and low pass filters in particular were used a lot to make things sound fatter and warmer. 
This is because by reducing the presence of the sharp, bright, high frequencies, we start to illuminate the mid and low frequencies more. In addition to this, different filters, whether they be analog or digital, will color the sound in different ways. And I wanted to put this to a bit of a test. And so I've got a Akai here, I've got my Emu, I've got an analog heat, and I've basically had a bit of a filter shootout and compared them against some VST versions of filters. And some of the differences are very subtle, but let's just see if you can hear from yourselves how all of these filters stack up against each other. Another way we see filters commonly being used is to bring static sounds to life through filter modulation and automation and there are two classic techniques I want to take a look at here. The first here is to slowly filter a bass line to increase or decrease its intensity over time. Another one is to slowly modulate pads, sometimes different layers of pads with different filters so you get them all intertwining and interweaving together to create a much more complex and deep sound than just having one static pad playing by itself. Here we've used filtering and layering together to sculpt and shape all of these different sounds to really make a bigger whole and to just give us lots of motion. And that's really the idea is to get these things moving kind of randomly over time and intertwining with each other. And there's one other technique that can really help us with this, and that's these ping pong loops. And not only do they let us uh, sustain these pad sounds indefinitely as it will keep pinging back and forth between these two loop points, but actually it gives you lots of harmonic interest and just more of that motion. Final thing that's worth mentioning here is these noise layers and I think these pads can just sound a little bit lackluster and maybe soulless if they don't have this sh sparkly shimmery dusty stuff kind of sat on the top of them and if I show you this uh, pad sample with or without the noise Clearly here there, it can be oceans crashing or the hiss of a record or white noise, or whatever it is, but it just helps to really bring these sounds to life. The pitch modulation wheel was first invented by Robert Moog in the early 1960s and is a great way to add expression and depth to your performances. The father of the modern synthesizer is undoubtedly Dr. Bob Moog. From the pitch wheel or automatically through modulation. Now the use of pitch modulation is not exclusive to Jungle by any means, but we do see it being used in a number of interesting ways. And probably the first one and maybe the most common one is just a slowly decreasing pitch sound and this will be great on strings and it just creates a little bit more of a dissonant or eerie feeling.
What I also love is these little expressive embellishments you can do to your melodic notes where you just flick the pitch wheel very briefly and it just helps to make things sound a little bit otherworldly and just take you away from maybe just boring old static synth sounds. Another one is a really cool trick we can do in our samplers and once again I've just got a sine wave in this Logic Quick Sampler and this is actually two ways to modulate pitch and the first one is I'm using an eighth note LFO with a, a triangle or a sine wave and if I play this note See it's got vibrato but the key is having a bit of a fade in as well can make it sound a bit more realistic and also just a low um, amount and it's just going to give you a little bit of that pitch movement. And then the other one, which is actually one of my favorite tricks, is to do uh, a random wave with quite a fast um, rate. And once again, to target pitch. And then if I pull this up a lot, it's going to get really crazy. It sounds like a robot talking. But... At a low level, you can see it's a really bland sine wave. But as I increase this a little bit, it has that instability in the pitch and it just makes things sound a little bit older and rougher, like they've been taken uh, through tape or just a bit more vintage in that way. So I think it's another really good trick um, to kind of emulate that 90s sound, even if it wasn't maybe a super common trick that they would have been using at the time. The final thing I think is worth mentioning here is the half note delay and I've been talking about this on my channel quite a lot recently but I really love it and I never used to utilize it enough and I just started hearing it in all these old jungle tracks when I was breaking them down and what I think it is is it just sounds more like an arp maybe than it does like a quarter note delay or a dotted delay which adds more rhythm the, the half note delay just sounds like you're repeating the idea that you already made anyway it's just a good delay time to use and it really works for this style of music so little melodic embellishments like this uh, where you're just playing like tiny little notes I think it works really well Okay, so now we're at the really juicy part of this tutorial. And I think one thing that probably shaped the sound of Jungle in the 90s the most was the equipment they were using. But actually, it was probably the way they were abusing this equipment in lots of unconventional ways that really imparted the characteristics and the unique qualities of those bits of gear onto the sound. Probably the most classic of these techniques was driving the inputs on an analog desk and the Mackies, the 16 channel Mackie and the 32 channel Mackie were really favoured by drum and bass artists of having a really pleasing kind of saturation and distortion when you drove those channels into the red and started to clip them. Okay, so there's this amazing video by Dillinger online from the Metalheads documentary where he basically shows you him smashing an 808 bass in his mixer and I couldn't include that in my video because it kept getting copyright strikes so I'm going to try and follow this workflow in my own and see how I get along. So what I've got is a nice long 808 uh, kick drum here and I'm going to sample this into my emu. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is go new uh, sample and just arm it. So it wants to have a long tail is the main thing there. Um, and I'm going to keep that. And then the next thing I'm also going to do, um, because those Mackies from the sounds of it, it's got loads of hiss and white noise in the mixer. I think when you just turn up the gain channels on the mixer, it adds a lot of white noise. Whereas my mixer doesn't quite have the same thing. But what I can do is when I really crank the channels, I can actually record um, 
the noise out of my mixer even though I can't bring it up in quite the same way. So I'm just going to record the kind of analog hiss or the noise floor from my mixer as well. Okay, cool. So now I've got the uh, 808 bass drum and the noise hiss sample and I'm going to create a new instrument here. Um, if I copy this one uh, down and then I'm going to put the hiss on this one and I know I'm going to have to turn that down loads in level uh, as well. So let me... So something like that where I've just got that nice hiss coming through on top of the bass. Okay, this could be cool. And now I'm just going to jump up to the mixer and show you what's going on up there. Okay, so you should be able to see my mixer now and I'm just triggering this from Logic, the MIDI instrument. And the idea is just to max out the gain on this strip and then turn down the master level so I can control the actual output level and not make it too loud for my ears. Okay, so we've got that real crazy distortion happening now. And in his video, he was doing some cool mixer tricks where he was kind of making a tremolo with the actual fader. There's just different ways you can do it, but that's, how, that's the way I'm doing it today. Another really dope technique these artists would use was actually on these old Akai hardware samplers and what they have is a record level. So you can actually drive this record level up and clip these signals as you're recording them on the way into the samplers but achieve quite a similar effect of saturating and distorting the signal. In a similar way to how we can record really hot on the Akai, in the Emu, whilst it wasn't as favourable to record hot, what they actually have is this gain function where you can essentially record your sound and then gain it up, up to about 60 dB I think, which is basically going to clip it, anything above zero it's going to start clipping and so you can introduce some more distortion and saturation that way. Once again I thought it would be really cool to have another little shoot off from all these different versions of analog processing just so we can hear if like the, the mix is sounding any different to driving in the Akai and just to hear them all compared against each other. Regarding both the driving into the analog desk and the recording hot in the Akai and the gain clipping on the Emu, what we're really doing is using clipping in lots of different ways to colour and affect the signal. Here the more we drive the signal into these various bits of equipment, the more harmonics we generate and the sharper and harsher the distortion becomes. Now I'm not going to go over it too much in this video because I did a really deep dive in my previous one but both sample rate and pitch interpolation can be used to degrade the sound and artists would use these techniques to impart that dusty crusty lo-fi goodness into their sounds. Finally, there is this wicked video by Fracture and Neptune up on the internet which shows them basically distorting an 808 bass and running it through their um, emu and resampling it and doing all these tricks to it. And I think it's just a really good example of how you can combine filtering and layering and then these kind of distortions by, by smashing the desk and then put them all together to create really complex and just dope sounding sounds. They essentially start with a clean 808 kick drum with a long tail. This is then slammed into their Mackie desk. And resampled back into the Emu. It's then also filtered in the Emu and resampled again.
After this, it's split with a high version and a low version, both filtered in different ways. And then those two are combined again with more filtering and then modulated for the final result. Okay, so you're nearly there now. And the last thing I want to talk about is some techniques specific to drum programming and break chopping. In the very early stages of jungle production in the mid 1990s, we see a lot of simple looping of breaks. This would essentially involve taking a clean drum break from a section of a track and then speeding it up to fit the much faster jungle tempo. These breaks were then often layered with other breaks or percussion layers to fill out the spectrum and make them more interesting. Finally, we begin to see more and more breakbeat style chopping, where artists would slice the breaks up into lots of different pieces and then rearrange them to form entirely new sequences. What we also start to see is artists using a bunch of effects and processing techniques to spice up their drums even more. And what I have here is a really simple two bar loop and I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of different techniques we can use to spice it up beyond just chopping it up and rearranging it. And the first thing I'm gonna do here is just extract this snare drum but you could do this with any of the elements that are in the original drum break. And the first thing we can do is pitch this snare up and down. We can also reverse it. Another really classic technique I love is to put a big mono reverb on the snare. And if you listen to a snare with a wide reverb, it sounds like the snare's in the middle and then the reverb is out in the stereo field. But if you put a mono reverb on, it comes right down the middle. So if I show you the two uh, compared against each other, You can hear the mono one sounds really cool and then also using different flavors of reverbs to give you different tonalities in the mono reverb snares. We can also gate our hits and this essentially just means pulling in the ends of the hits to make them a little bit more snappy but you can hear it makes them just a little bit more staccato and you hear this used a lot in jungle from that period as well. Another really classic technique is to take a snare drum and then to chuck it in the old Akai's and to stretch it out with that Akai time stretch. And I've just got an example here of the original snare drum and then a 200% Akai snare and then a 1000% Akai snare. So you can hear what it's doing to the sound. In the same way that we created our gated snares, we can also just shorten this snare sample and start to double it up. And then we can create rolls in this way. And so we can create like a, a roll there. And then maybe if I go and speed this roll up even more in this section um, and create a really fast one at the end. So it sounds quite robotic in this way. And one thing artists would do is put a volume fade. So if I group all of these and put a, a, uh, a fade on them, you can hear the level's gonna increase over time and it's gonna sound a little bit less robotic. Another one of my favorites is this phasing technique and it's actually really simple to do in a door like Logic and all you gotta do is copy your original track down to a new one and then if you come in you just need to delay it slightly 
And all I've done with this version here, which I've colored in, is I've chopped it at different points and then delayed them different amounts. And you'll hear the phasing will change the, uh, the kind of when the delay times between the two tracks are different. <laughs> Okay, so that's really it for me today. And just to finish off, I've got a bit of a medley here of all of these techniques going together. And then they just finish off in a bit of a track I've been working on with one of my patrons. So thank you very much for sticking with me so far. And I hope this has been a useful and insightful tutorial on all of these old jungle techniques from the 90s. So yeah, keep well until the next one. And that's all for me today. Peace.